Yeah, like. Well, uh, hello everyone uh, participating in this online uh, I focus uh, very popular course on UBIS. And today we have uh, the second lecture in the series uh, on a very important topic. Uh, personally, I feel for everyone who uh, wishes to practice uh, UBIS. Uh, anywhere in the world has to know uh, perforce about classification and epidemiology of uveitis uh, in their own ge geographical area. So Dr. Samira Nai, consultant at the Alvi Prasad Institute at the Vijayawada uh, branch is going to be uh, talking to us in details on the uh, subject. Uh, Samira is for you now to go on. Oh, uh, thanks, Dr. Gupta, for this uh, nice introduction. Can you stop sharing the slides? Yes, ma'am. You can share now. The first slide is visible. Yes, yes. yes. Hello, everyone. In this presentation, uh, I'll be talking on classification of uveitis uh, based on Sun Working Group, disease specific classification uh, criteria based on Sun Working Group, evaluation of Sun classification criteria, uveitis epidemiology. In 2005, major, uh, world's major uveitis society uh, societies uh, instituted standardization of uveitis nomenclature for reporting clinical data. And uh, this has been accepted across the world. In this, uveitis has been classified as per the anatomical location of inflammation. It is anterior uveitis when anterior chamber is involved. It could be iritis, iridocyclitis. Intermediate uveitis when it involves vitreous. It could be anterior cyclitis, pars planitis, posterior cyclitis, and uh, phalitis. Posterior uveitis when retina or choroid is involved. It could be focal, multifocal, or diffuse choroiditis. It could be chorioretinitis, retinochoroiditis, retinitis, or neuroretinitis. pan uveitis when it involves anterior chamber, vitreous, and retina or choroid. In this classification system, anterior chamber cells are also graded from zero to four. Zero meaning there is uh, there are no cells or uh, uh, there are no cells. 0.5 meaning uh, very few cells up to five, one plus up to 15 cells, two plus meaning up to 25 cells, three plus up to 50 cells, and four plus is more than 50 cells. The flare in anterior chamber also uh, uh, has been uh, graded zero to four. Uh, if uh, there is uh, no flare, it means the grade is zero. One plus meaning faint flare. Two plus meaning it is moderate. When iris and lens details are clear. Three plus when flare is marked, iris and lens details are hazy, but still visible. Four plus meaning there is intense flare in anterior chamber and there is fibrin or plastic appears and no iris or lens details visible. 
description of uvitis uh, as per the onset duration and course and it sorry the onset could be sudden or insidious the duration could be limited uh, within three months or beyond three months the course could be acute that is uh, episode characterized by sudden onset and limited duration recurrent when repeated episodes separated by periods of inactivity without treatment more than three months in duration. Uveitis is called chronic when there is persistent uveitis with relapse in less than three months after discontinuing treatment. Activity of uveitis uh, can be classified inactive, worsening, improved, or remission. Inactive meaning there is grade zero cells in AC or vitreous. Worsening meaning there is two step increase in level of inflammation. Improved activity meaning there is a two step decline in level of inflammation. Remission meaning inactive disease for more than three months after discontinuing all treatments for eye disease. In 2021, the Sun Group came up with disease-specific classification criteria. The goal was to define a homogeneous group of patients for inclusion in research studies, to exclude patients without disease patterns that might confound the data, these uh, classification criteria are actually disease specific. And in this, they have classified 25 subtypes of uveitis. We'll go one by one. The first uh, uh, group is uh, HLA-B associated anterior uveitis. This is usually seen in male patients in second to fourth decade. In general population, we see HLA positivity is 0.2% and out of which 1% will have uveitis. This uveitis is the commonest anterior uveitis. 18 to 32% of all anterior uveitis in the West and 6 to 13% in Asia are HLA B27 associated uveitis. This is a typical unilateral alternating non granulomatous recurring uveitis with high cellular reaction. In this, 23 to 37%, you will find zero negativity for HLA B27, and 49 to 84%, you will find zero positive for HLA B27. The disease specific criteria include evidence of anterior uveitis, meaning there are cells in the anterior chamber. If you find cells in the vitreous as well as in anterior chamber, then you have to see the uh, you have to see how many uh, how much cells in vitreous and anterior chamber. If it is anterior uveitis, then cells in the anterior chamber will be more than the cells in the vitreous. That's the spillover vitreitis. The second criteria is character, characteristic uveitis course, meaning acute or recurrent that I have already explained, the typical HLA-B associated anterior uveitis. The third criteria uh, is uh, association with axial or peripheral uh, polyarthritis, spondylo, sorry, spondyloarthritis with or without HLA-B27 positive. If the CVIT is present with chronic uveitic features, then presence of uh, axial or uh, peripheral spondyloarthritis is a must with HLA-B27 positivity. And of course, they have excluded syphilis and sarcoidosis and uh, viral uveitis. The next disease entity is basic disease. This is a systemic condition. 
very prevalent in silk route countries around the Mediterranean Sea. Highest prevalence is seen in Turkey. Other countries uh, very prevalent with this disease are Israel, Iraq, Iran, uh, Kuwait, Japan, China, Germany, and US. Usually second and fourth decade, uh, the UVH is, uh, sorry, the disease starts and uh, it is associated with HLA-B51. In the inclusion criteria, uh, there should be compatible UVH syndrome, meaning uh, presence of anterior UVH, anterior and intermediate UVH, posterior uveitis with retinal vasculitis and focal retinal infiltrates, pan uveitis with retinal vasculitis and or focal retinal infiltrates with a diagnosis of basic disease depending on the international study group for basic disease criteria. And in this, they have excluded positive serology for syphilis using trepanomal test and evidence of sarcoidosis. In most of the cases, they have excluded syphilis and sarcoidosis. The next entity is tubulointestinal nephritis and uveitis that is called TINU. Usually uh, young adults uh, may develop this entity. The median age at presentation is 15 years. This is actually a very underdiagnosed entity, very sparse reports from India, but actually one third of all acute onset bilateral pediatric uveitis are TINU in West. In uh, disease specific criteria, evidence of anterior uveitis is a must in the form of cells in the anterior chamber, and in the form of cells in vitreous, which your cells should be less than the anterior chamber cells, plus evidence of tubular intestinal nephritis. So that evidence you can get from a positive renal biopsy, or you can do a urine analysis to get beta microglobulin in urine. In this also, they have excluded syphilis and evidence of sarcoidosis. Next is herpes virus anterior uveitis. This is very common. Three to 10% of all uveitis cases are herpes virus anterior uveitis. Five to 10% of all anterior uveitis constitute herpes virus anterior uveitis. This is unilateral, sometimes presents with raised intraocular pressure. This could be acute or chronic. 30 to 40% of cases with HS associated with HSV keratitis. The classification criteria include evidence of anterior uveitis plus unilateral unilaterality plus evidence of herpes simplex infection in the eye in the form of PCR positivity in the aqueous humor or sectoral iris atrophy in, any, in, in the eye or herpes simplex keratitis. In this, you need to exclude uh, concomitant uh, cutaneous varicella zoster virus, positive serology for syphilis and sarcoidosis. Most of the cases that have excluded sarcoidosis and uh, syphilis because they can mimic any type of uveitis. Next is cytomegalovirus anterior uveitis, very common in Asia. 50% of Osner Spalsman people will have uh, CMB anterior uveitis. In this, uh, the uh, disease specific criteria include evidence of anterior uveitis plus evidence of cytomegalovirus in the eye in the form of positive PCR in aqueous humor specimen. The exclusion criteria uh, are positive serology for syphilis and evidence of sarcoidosis. They've also excluded uh, other viral uh, uveitis, herpes virus, varicella zoster virus. 
Next is varicella zoster virus anterior uveitis. This entity has a worldwide distribution. 20 to 30% of population are actually infected with uh, varicella zoster virus at any point of uh, their life. 10 to 20% of infected individuals will develop hospice zoster ophthalmicus. Once the trigeminal nerve gets affected, 50% will develop ocular disease. Common manifestation is anterior uveitis. Incidence of anterior uveitis uh, is 0.3% per year. The risk of anterior uveitis after any herpes zoster infection is increased to 13-fold. The risk of anterior uveitis in patients with herpes zoster ophthalmicus is 60%. The disease-specific criteria include evidence of anterior uveitis plus unilaterality plus evidence of varicella zoster virus infection in the eye in the form of PCR positivity in the aqueous or sectoral iris atrophy in a patient more than 60 years of age or conco concurrent or recurrent dermatological herpes zoster. Next is uh, Fuchs uveitis syndrome. 2 to 5% of all uveitis are uh, 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 Fuchs uveitis uh, syndrome. 50% uh, of them will have glaucoma and 80% of uh, Fuchs uveitis syndrome will develop cataract. The classification criteria are unilateral anterior uveitis with or without vitreitis, heterochromia of iris, unilateral diffuse iris atrophy, and stellate keratic precipitates. And in this also, they have uh, excluded syphilis, sarcoidosis, and other viral uveitis. Next is uh, juvenile idiopathic arthritis-associated chronic anterior uveitis. Uh, a typical presentation is asymptomatic white eye. It has two peaks, four to six years and 10 to 12 years. Uh, those who are NA positive, uh, those who have oligoarthritis and uh, female gender, all these are risk factors to develop anterior uveitis. The disease specific criteria include evidence of anterior uveitis, meaning AC cells, evidence of chronic anterior uveitis, uh, those are insidious onset, asymptomatic, asymptomatic, minimally uh, symptomatic, and presence of uh, juvenile idiopathic arthritis. It could be oligoarthritis, could be RA negative polyarthritis, or juvenile psoriatic arthritis. In this also, they have excluded uh, viral uveitis, syphilis, sarcoidosis, and uh, Anthocytes related arthritis. Next is intermediate uveitis, nor non pars plana type. In this, uh, the inclusion criteria uh, are evidence of intermediate uveitis, uh, like vitreous cells. If anterior chamber has cells, then the vitreous cells will be more than the anterior chamber cells because it's an intermediate uveitis and no evidence of retinitis with no evidence of pars planitis. And in this also, they have excluded multiple sclerosis, syphilis, sarcoidosis, and uh, Lyme disease and lymphoma. All this can cause intermediate uveitis, so they have excluded these entities. Next is pars planitis. 2.4 to 15% uh, of uveitis cases are actually pars planitis, and the incidence is uh, 2 to 1 lakh uh, per year. The criteria include uh, evidence of intermediate uveitis plus evidence of pars planitis in the form of snowballs and uh, pars plana snow banking. And in this also, 
you need to exclude multiple sclerosis, syphilis, sarcoidosis, and Lyme disease. Next is uh, multiple sclerosis associated intermediate uveitis. MS is, uh, the MS incidence is two to 300 per one lakh per year, depending on the geography. Usually females are affected. 25% of MS will develop optic neuritis. Optic neuritis is more common than uveitis. Only 1% may develop uveitis. In this, uh, the criteria, uh, classification criteria are evidence of intermediate uveitis with evidence of multiple sclerosis using revised McDonald diagnostic criteria. In this, they have also excluded syphilis and sarcoidosis. This is uh, toxoplasma retinitis. 25 to 30% of human population are infected with toxoplasma gondii. It is less in US 10% and uh, it is more in Brazil 50% in some literature it is 80 to 90% in preschool children. If the strain is virulent and the country's economy is poor then uh, there is more infection in that particular geographical area. Type 1, type 3 atypical strains are common in southern hemisphere whereas type 2 strain is common in Northern Hemisphere. This uh, ocular toxoplasma uh, is all, not always a congenital disease. 50% of ocular toxoplasmosis are actually acquired as per uh, a study in UK. 10% with systemic toxoplasmosis uh, actually, ocular toxoplasmosis is the presenting manifestations because systemic infection usually subclinical asymptomatic. The inclusion criteria, disease specific classification criteria include focal or posifocal retinochoroiditis plus evidence of toxoplasma gonda infection in the form of PCR positivity in aqueous or vitreous or IgM for toxo in serum of the patient or characteristic ocular features. So uh, what is that? Hyperpigmented atropic choreoretinal scar, round or oval retinitis lesion and recurrent acute course. Here also, they have excluded syphilis and uh, negative serology for IgG and IgM antibody against toxoplasma gondii and some viral retinitis. CMB retinitis is a very common posterior uveitis. 1% of renal transplant and 0.5% of bone marrow transplant uh, people will develop CMB retinitis. If there is HIV co-infection, then 30% risk of uh, development of CMB retinitis is there. In disease uh, specific uh, criteria, uh, necrotizing retinitis with indistinct borders due to numerous uh, small satellite lesions with immune compromise. This compromise could be systemic in presence of AIDS or organ transplant or chemotherapy, or it could be a local immune suppressed condition like intraocular corticosteroid therapy or intraocular chemotherapy plus characteristic clinical picture like well-shaped area of retinitis or hemorrhagic area of retinitis or granular appearance of retinitis. And there is absent or very mild vitritis. Or evidence of intraocular, intraocular infection with cytomegalovirus in form of positive PCR. Here also they have excluded syphilis and intraocular, other intraocular 
viral aviators. Acute retinal necrosis is very rare. 0.5 to 0.6 per 1 lakh per year in United Kingdom. The classification criteria for ARN include uh, peripheral necrotizing retinitis and confirmation of intraocular infection with HSP or uh, virusella joster via PCR of intraocular fluid or that is classic clinical picture. So what is classic clinical picture of ARN? Well demarcated area of retinal necrosis in the peripheral retina, rapid circumferential progression of retinal necrosis, occlusive vasculopathy, prominent inflammatory reaction in anterior chamber and vitreous. The second criteria, rapid circumferential progression of retinal necrosis that has been excluded by Sun Group because it requires multiple visits. So you cannot say rapid uh, if you see for once. Bird short chorioretinitis is very rare. 7% of all posterior uveitis are actually bird short chorioretinitis. 1% of all uveitis. The prevalence is 1 in 1 lakh. There is a high HLA A21 association with this entity. The disease specific criteria are characteristic bilateral multifocal choroiditis on ophthalmoscopy. Those are actually birdshot uh, uh, spots, plus absent to mild anterior chamber inflammation and no uh, keratic precipitate, no posterior synecky, plus absent to moderate vitritis or multifocal choroiditis with positive HLA A21 test and characteristic birdshot spots in posterior segment or characteristic ICZ finding for specific for birdshot chorioretinitis. Next is acute posterior multifocal placard pigment epitheliopathy. This is also very rare. Incidence is uh, 0.15 per 1 lakh per year. The inclusion criteria are posse, focal, or multifocal corridor lesion on clinical examination with plaque like or placoid appearance to the lesion, plus characteristic fluorescent angiogram in the acute phase of the disease. Uh, and here also they have excluded syphilis and sarcoidosis. Multifocal evanescent wider syndrome, another posterior uveitis, non-infectious type. It's also very rare. The incidence is 0 0.22 uh, per 1 lakh population per year. Usually women, uh, uh, women are affected. This is self-limiting and this is unilateral. The criteria include multifocal choroiditis, uh, um, sorry, multifocal chorioretinal gray white spots with uh, foveal granularity. Foveal granularity is very specific with characteristic fluorescent angiogram or uh, characteristic OCT finding. In uh, FFA, you will see wraith like hyperfluorescence, and in OCT, there will be hyperreflectivity at the level of ellipsoid zone, which may extend to outer nuclear layer of the retina, with absent to mild anterior chamber or vitreous inflammation. Sarpizinus choroiditis is also very rare. Less than 5% of all posterior uveitis are sarpizinus choroiditis. This is of unknown etiology. The classification uh, criteria include posse, uh, focal or multifocal choroiditis with an amoeboid or serpentine shape, plus characteristic imaging. Fundus fluorescent angiogram with early diffuse hyperfluorescent lesion and late hyperfluorescent lesion at the border, or fundus autofluorescence with hypoauto lesion with hyperauto borders. 
with absent to minimal anterior chamber and vitreous inflammation. Punctate inner choroiditis or peak. This is also rare. The incidence is 0 0.4 to 1 lakh per year. Young adult myopic women are affected with this entity. The classification criteria are multifocal choroidal inflammatory lesions. Uh, a predominant lesion size uh, is actually less than 250 micron and uh, presence of punctured lesion appearance. With le uh, lesions involvement of posterior pole with or without mid periphery, plus absent to minimal anterior chamber or vitreous inflammation. Next is uh, tubercular uveitis. Tuberculosis has a worldwide distribution. And this is one of the top 10 causes of uh, death worldwide. <clears throat> Two third of TB cases in <clears throat> eight endemic countries, including Hello. India. Sorry. Hello. Hello. 9% of uh, TB are co infected with HIV. Prevalence of uh, TB uveitis uh, is 0 0.2 to 2.7 in non-endemic country, and it is increased to 5.6 to 10.5 percent in an endemic uh, country. In non-endemic, it is 2.7 percent, and in endemic country, it is up to 10.5 percent. Tubercular uveitis could be TB serpiginous lycoroiditis. TB focal choroiditis, TB multifocal choroiditis, tuberculoma, TB retinal vasculitis, TB intermediate uveitis, TB anterior uveitis, and TB panuveitis. The disease specific criteria include uh, evidence of a tubercular uveitis, compactable tubercular uveitis. Uh, what is compactable TB uveitis? Uh, presence of anterior uveitis with iris nodules or serpiginous like tubercular choroiditis or choroidal nodule or multifocal choroiditis or occlusive retinal vasculitis, plus evidence of infection with mycobacterium tuberculosis, either histologically or microbiologically, Posit or positive IGRA or positive tuberculin skin test. Syphilitic uveitis uh, nowadays uh, is increasing. 2.1% in 2001 and 9.5% in 2017 in US. It involves all races and all ethnicity. Male gender, homosexuality, and HIV co-infections are actually the risk factors. 1 to 2% of all uveitis in a referral eye care center are syphilitic uveitis. 0.5% of systemic disease, so uh, ocular syphilis. 9% of HIV with syphilis, so ocular syphilis. The disease specific criteria include uveitis with a compatible uveitic presentation, meaning presence of anterior uveitis or intermediate uveitis or posterior or panuveitis with one of the following presentation. One is placoid inflammation of the retinal pigment epithelium or multifocal inflammation or necrotizing retinitis or retinal vasculitis with evidence of infection with trypanoma pallidum either positive trypanomal test and non-trypanomal test. A positive trypanomal test with two different non-trypanomal tests. And here syphilis, uh, history of adequate treatment for syphilis uh, need to be uh, excluded. Wo Kainegi Harada disease, uh, this is also a kind of systemic condition. Uh, females are uh, affected more than the males. East Asia, South Asia, and Middle East are more uh, prevalent with this entity. 
the disease specific criteria are uh, evidence of hereditary disease, presence of serous exudative retina detachment, and multi loculated appearance on OCT or on fluorescent angiogram, or panivitis with more than two of the following neurologic symptoms. What are those neurologic symptoms? Headache, tinnitus, meningismus, and CSF leucytosis. Plus, there should be no history of penetrating ocular trauma. This is very important. And no history of vitroretinal surgery. And here, syphilis and sarcoidosis are to be excluded. Sympathetic ophthalmitis and other paniviitis. Uh, the following on ocular trauma, uh, the incidence is 0.022 to 0.5%, and following ocular surgery, 0.1%. The inclusion criteria are history of unilateral ocular trauma or surgery, that is very important, with ocular inflammation either bilateral or if there is no view in the inciting eye, then unilateral. With evidence of more than uh, isolated anterior uveitis, either anterior chamber or vitreous inflammation or pan uveitis with choroidal involvement. And here syphilis and sarcoidosis are also excluded. The sarcoidosis uh, is a systemic condition. 20 to 70% uh, cases, there is ocular involvement. 30 to 40% uh, cases of systemic sarcoidosis actually present with ocular sarcoidosis. Uh, it has varied presentation anterior uveitis, intermediate uveitis, posterior uveitis, and pan uveitis. The disease specific criteria include compactible uveitis picture, meaning presence of anterior uveitis or intermediate uveitis or posterior uveitis or pan uveitis with evidence of sarcoidosis, either tissue biopsy or bilateral hyla lymphadenopathy on chest imaging. Here we need to exclude syphilis and tuberculosis. Multifocal choroiditis with panuviitis, the incidence is uh, 0.3 to 1 lakh population per year. 2.4% of all uveitis are multifocal choroiditis with panuviitis. This is bilateral, young, middle-aged adults are affected with this condition. The classification criteria include multifocal choroiditis with oval or round lesion and predominant lesion size more than 125 micron with characteristic appearance. So what is that characteristic appearance? Sponsed out atrophic chororetinal scar or active lesion with more than minimal vitreous inflammation plus inflammatory lesion and or characteristic scar involving the mid-periphery or periphery with or without posterior pole involvement. So here syphilis, sarcoidosis, and tuberculosis are to be excluded before diagnosing, diagnosing this condition. So one study has actually uh, uh, evaluated the sun classification criteria. In this, they have included 1,143 patients out of which 50% uh, could not be included in the sun classification criteria because the diagnosis did not match. Only 50% uh, of the patients uh, are included in the sun classification disease specific criteria. And out of which 91.4% actually uh, fit into the specific disease uh, criteria as described by the sun. So sun disease classification criteria worked well in 50% of patients in 
real world scenario. These are the some epidemiological studies uh, on uveitis from India. So in India, the commonest uveitis is anterior uveitis followed by posterior uveitis and intermediate uveitis. The commonest infectious uveitis is tubercular origin except one study. And uh, there is male predominance in uveitis clinic. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Samira, for the excellent uh, presentation. Uh, there are a lot of questions uh, in this session. So uh, with the permission of uh, Dr. J.B. Sir and Dr. Amon Gupta, uh, shall I uh, ask the question, sir? Sure, sure. Go ahead. So first, we'll take up the hot seat uh, participant questions because they are on the hot seat. So the first question is how to differentiate cells and flare? Uh, well, uh, the anterior chamber uh, should be examined with the help of a uh, slit lamp. Uh, the slit lamp, there, there is a technique, uh, the illumination is to be very high and uh, the width should be 1 mm. Uh, there should be a small beam focused into the anterior chamber. The cells you can see, uh, white is gray, uh, cells moving in the anterior chamber, but the flare you cannot make out. So there will be, uh, you know, uh, flare is uh, quite hazy, but cells definitely you can make out. Uh, they will be moving in the anterior chamber. But many a times cells will confuse with RBC, but RBCs are very small and gray looking. But cells you definitely you can make out from flare. Flare yeah. is... If I can intervene, yes. uh, Mira, the question uh, posed was how to tell the difference between flare and the cells. And, you know, the reason, uh, because these are used practically always together. Now, we have to understand that the flare is the uh, due to the presence of proteins in the aqueous humor. Normally, because of the uh, blood aqueous barrier, the proteins do not leak into the, into the aqueous humor. And so that when you throw a beam of light across the entire chamber, it remains dark. But when you start seeing, and uh, you know, because of the increased protein content, then you will see the haziness. Okay, it's something uh, similar to if you have noticed, you know, uh, the sunlight, uh, coming into a dark room through a tiny hole or a you know a perture in a uh, in a in a window or in a dark shade you know it, it comes into the room as a flare uh, you know that's what we call the flare and this can actually be measured now so I think uh, uh, what sun classification uh, you know which you mentioned uh, given by uh, you know 2005 by Doug Jabs and other, you know, probably we have now more objective way of measuring the flare by flare meter. And you can actually measure in terms of photons per second, the value so that you can actually uh, objectively assess the, uh, the effect of any treatment that you apply. The cells on the other hand uh, will appear uh, when uh, there's a little more breakdown in the blood aqueous barrier and the cells actually move out of the blood vessels. So first the proteins move out and then it is followed by the movement of the cells. Now cells are like particulate matter. So if you have dust particles in the sunbeam, you know, they will shine uh, as you throw the light and you would, that's how you are able to count them. But I'm not aware of anybody who can actually, actually uh, sits there and counts the number of cells in that one millimeter beam, uh, you know, uh, that's that's not really practical. So uh, I would put it that way. So I hope uh, whoever asked this question is clear about this confusion between flare and cells. 
Thank you, sir, for explaining it so lucidly. Uh, the next question is, uh, serpiginous choroiditis etiology is only due to tuberculosis, and why is the shape amoeboid? You know, the, the confusion is because the serpiginous choroiditis, which is called the classic serpiginous choroiditis, uh, we still do not know uh, if it is infective in origin. Uh, because they, all along, it's extremely rare uh, condition. And I might have seen just one odd patient in my own experience. Okay, now it follows a serpentine. It's not simultaneously active all along. So when you're talking about uh, uh, fundus uh, fluorescein angiography or uh, best way to uh, discover or detect activity in uh, serpiginous choroiditis is the tip of one of the limbs of this serpentine or geographic pattern that we see, and I won't know why it uh, assumes that uh, serpentine appearance, but the fact remains that it is the tip, it grows only, gets activated. So sometimes, you know, one limb gets activated, another time another limb gets activated, only at the tip. And that shows hyperautofluorescence. So by doing autofluorescence, you can actually discover whether this patient has uh, activity or not. These patients do not have any signs of inflammation uh, in the eye. And that's why for a long time, they are considered as uh, you know, the degenerative condition. Uh, we still don't know the exact etiology. On the other hand, serpiginous lycoroditis, which we described uh, almost like 18, 19 years ago, is associated with tuberculosis. Now we seen the commonest phenotype uh, that we see uh, in uh, endemic countries, TB endemic countries like India is uh, TB serpiginous like because it is associated with a lot of uh, vitreous cells. It has multifocal, uh, uh, unlike the classic, which is the unifocal or a monolithic uh, peripapillary lesion and which keeps extending, you know, uh, uh, around. This one is a mono, uh, multifocal, okay. And it spares the, uh, the peripapillary choroid for a long time, you know. So you, these are the multifocal lesions uh, which expand and coalesce and they form that so that each of these multifocal lesions would there'll be a central healing and an active wedge, okay. And uh, by and large, uh, you know, about 50% or 60% would be bilateral. So there's, you can always tell the difference between classic and TB, uh, uh, serpentinous like choroiditis. I think these are two different phenotypes and the confusion is caused because earlier people did not describe uh, uh, to TB infection. Uh, some cases have been reported, I think, by uh, Sankranetralia, as well as uh, by Don Gas, who first gave the idea that it could be caused by uh, uh, viral infection like herpes zoster. Personally, I have seen one such patient uh, of herpes zoster uh, of Thalamicus causing uh, serpiginous choroiditis or serpiginous like choroiditis in the eye, but that did not show progression. Okay, the lesion looked like that, the phenotype looked like that, but did not show any progression. These classic serpiginous choroiditis requires auto, uh, uh, you know, immunomodulatory therapy. People like to give two, three, or combination uh, therapy there. Whereas TB serpiginous like choroiditis would require corticosteroids and anti-TB drugs, and you will have remission in about 85, 90% of the cases. But beware, the moment you uh, give these people uh, anti-TB drugs, there is a adverse reaction or paradoxical worsening in nearly half of these patients. So if the lesions are pretty close to the foveal center, uh, I would be very cautious about uh, putting them on anti-TB drugs without giving them adequate immunosuppression with oral corticosteroids. I hope I made that uh, clear. Yes, sir. Uh, Very nice. Uh, I will say, a lot, sir. Yeah, can I take just uh, two minutes? Uh -huh. okay. so, uh, Dr. Samita, thank you. Actually, you have made a very. Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Please, 
Please. Okay. I think it is an extensive coverage of the uh, all the classifications we have in UVITIS. So I just, because it's a PG-centric program, I just want to highlight two classifications. This is mainly uh, important for uh, academic purpose. So first one is the oldest classification of UVITIS. Uh, most of you are well aware of that. That is actually devised by Alan Churchill Wood. And sometimes it is called Wood's classification or it is clinical pathological classification. That actually divides into non-granulomatous uveitis and granulomatous uveitis. And most of you know that the non-granulomatous uveitis is characterized by acute onset. There will be a lot of injections, uh, pain, whereas in granulomatous, the onset is insidious and chronic, and uh, injection and pain will be less than that. And uh, the KP-wise non-granulomatous is characterized by confluent fine KPs, and the granulomatous is uh, characteristically described as large mutton fat KPs. So another classification which is very rarely used nowadays and it has only historical importance is that classification devised by the Duke elders. Often it is, uh, it is called etiological classification. This is not, uh, uh, let me just tell you, this is the classification only of historical importance and it is mainly used for the academic purpose. Nowadays, we don't follow it. So in etiological classification, they have divided into infective, idiopathic, toxic, traumatic, allergic uveitis and uveitis associated with non-infective systemic disease. So this was the two classification, I think, that for the postgraduate, you, you should know. Over to you, Avilasha. Yes, sir. Thanks, sir. So since we are talking about TB, we'll finish the TB questions. Uh, the next question is tubercle, tuberculoma, and tubercular granuloma. Are they all the same? I think, JV, would you like to answer that question? Tubercle, oh. tuberculoma, tubercle, uh, uh, tubercular granuloma? This is just a size of the lesion. Tubercle, tuberculoma is uh, more or less the same uh, pathology. And this is that uh, small nodules, this is called tubercle. And when it's a large one, is a tuberculoma. And, but there's another entity called subretinal abscess to the tuberculosis. There is a, you can see the organisms may be there inside that abscess. So this is a size of tubercle versus tuberculoma. So tuberculoma is, uh, we have seen in not uh, um, many uh, uh, patients uh, of, of, of the tuberculosis in late, latent tuberculosis, active tuberculosis, we often see that kind of tuberculoma of the choroid. Yeah. Thank see, you so much, As, uh, as uh, uh, Partha was mentioning, you know, uh, granulomatous and non-granulomatous inflammation. So as clinicians, we often confuse and, you know, mix the pathological terms uh, with the uh, yeah. clinical descriptions. Okay. So when we say granuloma, we are actually using a pathological term, you know. So uh, I think it's acceptable. So long as we understand what we mean, uh, I have no fight with the uh, being, uh, you know, these are all question of semantics, how you say, you know, so I don't call it as the granulomatous KPs. I said that the mutton fat KPs. Yeah. Because we don't, granuloma means an histopathology. That is why it's in epithelial cells. You, under the microscope, when you say, they call it granuloma. But if you see mutton fat KP, is mutton fat KPs. Sure. I think that's the way to do it. You know, give the yeah. phenotype, the descriptive. I think uh, what we lack here is description. You know, we must be able to describe uh, the what we are seeing in a given patient with uveitis. Uh, that Thank will be covered. Yes, Dr. Yes, yes uh, the, there are two criteria, uh, diagnostic criteria and uh, classification criteria. I have skipped diagnostic criteria that will be covered in subsequent uh, classes, I guess. And uh, uh, only... Uh, uh, classification criteria I have mentioned in the presentation. Uh, I have one point related to granulomatous and non-granulomatous uveitis. Nowadays, uh, people are avoiding to use this terminology because uh, particularly in sun classification because uh, uh, many uveitis, uh, uh, they may start with non-granulomatous and uh, 
अकॉर्डिंग टू द रिव्यू दैट आई है कैन बी ड्यू टू एच एल ए बी ट्वेंटी मे बी एच एल ए बी ट्वेंटी सेवन पॉजिटिव and uh, there are data separate data from western countries so western countries uh, they say that about uh, uh, 30 to 40% are uh, hla b27 positive and in the asian po uh, population the percentage is a little less it's about uh, 12 to 20% of anterior uveitis uh, hla b27 is more prevalent in uh, western countries Uh, uh sir would you like to add anything jb sir amol gupta sir so this point we uh, we do see hla b27 positive anterior uveitis they often present with the uh, hypopian and one of the cause of the if you see an hypopian anterior uveitis think of hla b27 positivity you should do that and if it is associated with the ankylosing spondylitis the hla b27 will come goes to 80 to 90% uh, time um so hla b27 is is a not a uh, uh, what you call is a morphologic diagnosis is the kind of an association only and i will not treat differently an hla b27 positive anterior uveitis i with hyperpian with hla b27 non negative hyperpian i'll treat according to the merit of the inflammation yes sir uh, thank you sir and the next question is how often is uh, hla b27 associated with systemic features i think so, this is uh, pretty common uh, actually every patient uh, of acute anterior uveitis you must get evaluation done by a physician especially the rheumatologist because the consequences of missing uh, ankylosing spondylitis could be very yeah. serious uh, for the for the uh, patient you know because uh, uh, so you need to ask them the history of morning stiffness difficulty in getting out of the bed whether he needs a patient needs to roll out of the bed you know then the physician will order mri these days rather than uh, you know the x ray that we used to order earlier for looking at the sacroiliac joint whether it's uniform or whether it's uh, irregularity is there or there is erosion there you know uh, stuff that like they see otherwise these patients uh, uh, if you know they tend to develop that bamboo spine and if you had yeah. that kind of bamboo spine you know you had it uh, you are deformed and many of these patients who have peripheral arthropathies you know they have stiffness of all the joints and they have to undergo a lot of joint replacements for regaining their mobility because they become wheelchair bound so the diagnosis and these are young people uh, young men uh, who come to you and if you miss the diagnosis you know it could be very serious because the most symptomatic uh, uh, i symptoms are the most symptomatic i would say i disease compared to the back ache and people say okay i have got back ache in the morning you know but it gets all right by the time i am going to work because morning movements and you know it's opposite uh, the, why people get the deformity is because they start taking rest because that's what is prescribed generally people who have back ache you know they'll say okay lie down flat and take rest here rest makes the disease worse so the more they move the 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 joints remain mobile okay so that's why it has to be seen by a physician at the first instance nowadays a lot of good treatment is available for ankylosing spondylitis and yes. and the mobility can be just improved quite a bit 
and uh, like biologic agents biologic. and disease modifying agents and you should not allow them to go for a uh, debilitating conditions like you know uh, bamboo spines and all so ophthalmologist has got a good role to detect it and send them to rheumatologist so that they yes. can get early treatment yeah because they 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 the first point of contact would be an ophthalmologist uh, where yeah. they present with the uveitis and not the physician yes sir so thank you sir so about uh, 50 to 80% patients with hla b27 positive anterior uveitis have systemic features and uh, there is uh, there are reports that about uh, 10 to 15% patients who are hla b27 positive have anterior uveitis develop spondyloarthropathy in the next 9 years so they have to be followed up also yeah uh, so just because sure, anterior sure. uveitis has been treated so you know actually we Patient don't have not be lost to follow up ulcerative colitis and psoriasis are also associated uh, much less frequently with the uveitis uh, but they tend to have bilateral and uh, these are uh, uh, the other two uh, hla b27 associated uh, disorders uh, which could be psoriatic arthritis ulcerative colitis yes. and uh, ankylosing spondylitis when these are the three kind of different uh, uh, clinical scenarios you know for the patients thank you sir moving on to the last two questions uh, can you please uh, elaborate the classification criteria for intermediate uveitis and pars planitis yeah samira you are the best yes. samira can you answer this yes yes so the difference in the intermediate uh, uveitis is when you see the so intermediate uveitis can be idiopathic or it can be pars planitis when it's uh, when, when it's idiopathic it's pars planitis and most of yes. them have associated snow banks but when you can ascribe a patho- uh, etiology to intermediate uveitis in our country you must remember that tb may present as intermediate uveitis very commonly sarcoid may present as intermediate uveitis then multiple sclerosis may present as intermediate uveitis and you know the lyme disease may present as intermediate uveitis so intermediate uveitis indicates only the 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 morphology the presence of severity of inflammation is maximum in the vitreous cavity compared to the anterior chamber and there is no obvious retinal or choroidal pathology that is visible okay all these uh, Uh, criteria anterior intermediate posterior pan uveitis is based on what you see as a clinician and not any other uh, any other thing okay so if you have maximum uh, locus of inflammation you see is in the vitreous cavity and you may have spillover inflammation in the anterior chamber then even then it is a intermediate uveitis yes sir uh, can i yeah swira yeah, yeah. so in uh, recent sun classification they have included three types of intermediate uveitis uh, the first is intermediate uveitis uh, non pars plana type the second is pars planitis and the third one is uh, multiple sclerosis associated intermediate uveitis yeah so yes and they have excluded lyme disease uh, sarcoidosis and other intermediate yes. uveitis you know you said that that you need to exclude all those uh, so they can uh, present with intermediate uveitis and uh, they would have associated features which would classify them into multiple sclerosis or sarcoid or syphilis or tb or any such known etiology thank you uh, moving on to the last question for the evening how different is the presentation in infectious versus immune related retinochoroiditis the yeah, difference in presentation wait for a week uh, i am going to give a full lecture on this subject uh, yes, uh, next wednesday 8 o'clock so you will have uh, that lecture how to tell the difference because it's it's a key key to Uh, just to suffice to say that most often the uveitis or retinal inflammations are infectious in origin 
with few honorable exceptions like Bacher's disease. And choroiditis is by and large an autoimmune or immune mediated disease. So this will, if you are able to classify to that extent, you will not be making any. So you must be able to tell the difference whether it's choroiditis or it's retinitis. Okay. I say retinochoroiditis because we use these terms very loosely. You know, we say chorioretinitis, toxoplasma chorioretinitis, which is a wrong term to use because toxoplasma is primarily a retinitis which goes into the choroid and we call it retinochoroiditis. Whereas TB starts in the choroid, it doesn't start in the retina, it starts in the choroid and goes into the retina and we call it a chorioretinitis, that the primary site is the choroid. Okay, so these are very fine nuanced differences, but then they will tell you uh, how to approach them for the, from the treatment point of view. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you to the experts, uh, Dr. Amod Gupta, sir, and Dr. JB, sir, for giving uh, such detailed uh, uh, pearls to take home. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Partho, sir, and uh, thank you, Dr. Samira, for the excellent talk and the great points that you added. Uh, over to Subhav. Uh, before we call it a day, I have two small announcements to make. The much-awaited physical eye focus is back for a 360-degree ophthalmology coverage for the postgraduate students. It starts on February 26th and till March 5th. The registrations are still open and everybody can register at www.miraevents.com. And uh, we meet next on Friday at 8 p.m. on December 9th. And the topic for discussion would be history taking in uveitis patients by Dr. S. Balamurgan. Thank you all for such a lovely evening. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.